Hi, everyone. Welcome to the uh, data and performance management meeting. Uh, please enter your agency name into the chat box so we know who is participating. And thank you for joining us. Um, for those that may not be familiar, uh, the format of this meeting is to discuss items with the group. So if you can either um, be on your phone or able to unmute yourself on your computer so that you can um, discuss as items come up, that would be great. If not, um, you can go ahead and enter um, into the chat if you have any questions or comments that you'd like to, to add, um, and that would work as well. So please um, don't be shy and um, participate as you feel comfortable. So we have um, a little bit of a longer agenda than normal, but I don't think uh, these items will take very long. So it should go fairly quickly. Um, I wanna follow up on the minimum participation requirements that we discussed last month. I wanna talk a little bit about agency administrator and coordinated entry user access in HMIS. Um, and then I wanna get some feedback from the group on the HMIS monthly webinars and then finish with the permanent supportive housing and other permanent housing project performance reports. Okay, so we did discuss this last time. Um, this is kind of the culmination of what we discussed um, as a draft policy that um, will be potentially added to the policies and procedures. So I wanted to um, check in with the group on this. And then I had a couple of additional questions on uh, the minimum participation requirements. So based on the feedback last time um, and when this minimum participation policy is implemented, 2N1OC will conduct a quarterly review of each agency's minimum participation um, to make sure they are meeting the requirements listed, which I'll go over in a second. Um, any agencies that are not meeting those requirements will have a month to resolve those issues. And if it's not resolved, um, we will be working with the HMIS Agency Access Working Group to, um, we'll, we'll share with them what's going on and they will determine whether or not the agency should continue to have access to HMIS. Um, and if, if the issue is recurring, if it comes up three or more times in a year for the same agency, we will also notify the HMIS Agency Access Working Group about that. And they will also uh, make a decision about continued HMIS access. So the minimum participation requirements that we discussed are here. The first is that the agency does, so any of these would, would be kind of a flag for um, resolution with the agency. The first is the agency doesn't have at least one active user. Also, the agency does not have at least one active enrollment. The agency does not have activity in HMIS in the past 30 days which includes enrollment services, assessments, files, or exits. The agency did not submit the HIC or PIT for their appropriate project types. The agency does not have at least one agency administrator that is an active HMIS user. And this last one we did not discuss, but I wanted to get feedback from the group. Agency has not had staff representation for at least one user meeting during the previous quarter. Um, so let me go back. Um, I wanted to give everybody a minute to think about that. And then if you have any feedback on these minimum participation requirements or questions, we can talk about that also. So I'll let everyone think for a minute. Erin, can I ask a quick question? This is Catherine. Sure. Um, for all of these bullet points that are listed, there 
all of those are included in the minimum participation requirements, right? So it's not like they have to meet at least one of those. They're expected to meet all of those. Yes. Okay, thank you. One thing I did also want to bring up with the group, um, there are some agencies that are coordinated entry access points. And um, so their, their main contribution to HMIS is being a coordinated entry access point. And so if we looked at their agency's activity, it may say that their agency didn't have any active enrollments because they are entering enrollments under the coordinated entry project. So the second one, they may not meet in that case. So um, my question to the group is, should we expand this to say at least one active enrollment in the agency's projects or at least active enrollment in a coordinated entry project? Um, or should agencies participating in coordinated entry also be contributing data for their own projects in HMIS? I think it would be good to expand that um, to say, or at least one enrollment into CES. Um, <clears throat> I think that that would probably be the best way to go um, in order to have them still meet that minimum participation. Does anybody else have thoughts on that or any of these minimum participation requirements? I think it's pretty cut and dry. I mean, this is bare minimum here. So, but I, I agree with um, with Catherine on the last comment. Um, CES, if I mean, I would like to make it a little stricter to say like if you're if you're an agency that's providing services and you're only using CES and not your HMIS for your own programs, then that kind of sucks. But like. Um, at least they're contributing to the system somehow. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I, I also would like to push it, but I also don't want to, I guess, scare people away from participating in, in the coordinated entry system as an access point. Um, I'm also... I also wasn't sure about the user meeting um, requirement, if it was um, unreasonable, but it seems like nobody's having any issues with it. Go ahead, Catherine or Cassie. Um, I, I do not think that that's unreasonable to have at least one staff member at at least one user during a uh, user meeting during a quarter. I, I think that that's like a, a bare minimum thing um, to, to have that there. I think. That is good. Yeah, same. I th I thought that that was always kind of in place, but maybe that was just kind of instilled in me. But um, yeah, bare minimum, bare minimum. Yeah, I I think we've we've tried to encourage that in the past, and it, it might even be like in our data quality plan. But um, this is like officially having a means of tracking it and following up on it. So I think that's why we wanted it in writing here. Um, all right, so I got a quick little poll on this one um, to go over what we just discussed. So everybody take a quick minute um, to answer the two questions. The first is in regards to um, updating the language on this second bullet point here to incorporate agencies that are participating in coordinated entries and access point. Um, the second is what we also just talked about. Should each agency be re required to have at least one staff person at a user meeting um, every quarter? So I'll give everyone a second to answer those.
All right, a couple more seconds. All right, I'm gonna end the poll and everybody said yes to both. So great, that's easy. <laughs> um, thanks for your feedback. Um, let me just make a note of this really quick and then we'll move on to the next one. Okie doke. Okay, so before we get into the next two items, I wanted to just review additional agency access with everybody really quick because it's gonna help you contribute to this discussion. So there are some users in Clarity that have access to multiple agencies. So what this means is that um, users can contribute data, um, edit data, complete reporting for all projects at any agencies they have access to. So um, you can see down here, the standard access is a user has access to one agency's data and they complete data entry or any reporting for that agency. Um, but some users have access to multiple agencies. So they have their primary agency, which is where they're employed or um, where they're residing as an employee, I guess, um, or who they're associated with. And then they can have access to other agencies as well and, and complete that same type of data entry reporting, um, all that stuff. Usually this occurs either when users need access to the coordinated entry system, or if users are at an agency that is in a collaborative with other agencies and they're, um, sharing data across that collaborative. So um, the next two items on our agenda are related to users with this additional agency access um, and what they should be able to do under those other agencies that are not their primary agency. So for agency administrators, um, in addition to all of the standard access that a user has in HMIS, agency administrators have access to delete um, items in Clarity that users do not. And so the items that they can delete are enrollments, files, locations, and assessments. Um, the enrollments are what most of you should be familiar with, if a, if a client enters a project, you capture that enrollment and administrator can delete that. Files are um, documents that are uploaded into Clarity, um, usually as PDFs, and this is frequently associated with the coordinated entry system and documents that are required for them to be um, added to the community queue, but it's not exclusive to coordinated entry. Locations are um, less frequently used, but they are pretty much exactly what it sounds like. It's like a, a pin drop of where that client is located or where um, you have found them in the past. And assessments um, are also fairly common. They're used in coordinated entry for the VI SPADATs. They're also used for current living situation assessments, um, annual assessments and status assessments all that stuff. So my question for the group is, should agency administrators with additional agency access have this same level of access to delete these things at other agencies? Um, and the reason I ask is because um, I, I don't know if the group has feedback on whether or not an agency administrator knows enough about the data entry that's going on to be able to delete this stuff, or if it really should be the responsibility of the agency administrators that are like the primary users at that agency. Um, but I'll, I'll take everyone's thoughts on that. Um, I have a thought. <clears throat> so do I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple things. Um, 
I think CES is kind of a, um, uh, a a rare, you know, case in this. I think they should have access to what they need to have access to. But um, as somebody who has had access to um, a collaborative project and being the lead agency on that project um, when I was at Mercy House, um, there were a couple of times where we had, um, you know, we had agencies that fell out of the collaborative or agencies that were non-responsive or agencies that had changed um, staffing while we were, um, you know, trying to get a hold of them. And, you know, it, it always started off with an email saying like, hey, you have a dupl duplicated client or you have, uh, you know, a duplicated enrollment or whatever the case may be. Um, and, or like, you know, something looks super funky and, you know, it never <laughs> fails, especially with assessments. Um, and, um, so like we would be the lead on the APR and we would have to like go in and check against everybody else's data as well. So oftentimes we had to do, I mean, if we couldn't get a response within, you know, an ample amount of time or whatever, it was always very difficult to kind of corral everybody and get them to do what they needed to do. Um, so sometimes we did need additional access, that additional access that um, to, you know, delete things or move things around or edit things. And, um, you know, in those rare cases, um, I think it's, it's good to have access to it as long as there is no, um, you know, the, your power isn't being, you know, abused in that. And I think like agency administrators, if, it, if it's a situation like that, where they do know enough about the data entry um, process from the other agency, I think that, um, you know, again, as long as the agency administrator is doing things wisely and not, um, you know, abusing their power of just deleting things because they want to, um, or they think it's correct. I think that having access to it and being able to like manipulate things by themselves could be beneficial. That's my two cents on that. Okay, Caitlin, did you wanna weigh <laughs> Um, yeah, that's not where I thought she was going with that, but <laughs> I, so she, she has more experience than me in the, in, you know, this retrospect, but, um, I, I don't know that this concept makes me like a little bit nervous just because I would be concerned that, um, like for what Cassie was saying, like lack of communication, say they deleted, the wrong enrollment by accident or um, accidentally deleted something that wasn't supposed to be deleted, or maybe they um, decided that they, like maybe they thought they knew what they were doing. Like, I don't know, I could just see that this like might cause some errors. And then if there's no communication, then we could end up losing um, important data. But I do see Cassie's point. There has been maybe one or two times myself where I was doing something and I and it would have been easier to have access to like um, fix some sort of data error, but um, I don't know. I'm still a little nervous about it. I feel like <laughs> that's, I, I would just be concerned that, um, I would hope that the other agencies are training the date, the like agency administrators enough to be totally comfortable with what they're doing mm -hmm. um, to, you know, delete something or have, like Cassie said, just to not, you know, take advantage of the um, having access of doing that, I guess. I'm a little skeptical, but. <laughs> Catherine, you wanna? Um, so I am, 
a lot skeptical. Um, I, I definitely see Cassie's point, right? Where if you're on that side of it and, you know, you're responsible for something that is housed under another, you know, under a different agency and, and that inhibits your ability to do your work, then um, that's extremely frustrating. Um, and, you know, this would definitely solve that problem. Um, I think from a coordinated entry perspective, of course, that's the lens I'm viewing this from. Uh, and I think that that would make it very, I think that that's really concerning if, you know, a lot of agency administrators at <clears throat> agencies who participate in CES um, may not have the same level of training um, in order to like really understand like why an enrollment would need to be deleted or um, like really understanding that component of it. Um, even like deleting files or something that I, I think that it would just be, um, yeah, I would, I'd be really hesitant and like uncomfortable, I think with having that happen. Um, and then, you know, a, another just side note, and that's not like, because I'm doubtful of like other agency administrators capabilities or, um, or thinking that they would have like malintent, right. But just, um, I think that it could just present a lot of issues and without knowing that that was deleted, right? Like we wouldn't get any notification um, if a different agency administrator did that. And, you know, that could, I think, present some really big data quality issues. I think there's another lens to that as well, that if you're the agency administrator and like you're in charge of that agency and you're having to either run those reports and see the errors or someone's having to come to you and request that you delete or fix something, that's an opportunity for you to like provide that training um, to a collaborative partner or um, to someone that you're doing, you know, this group contract with. Um, and so it allows you as the primary agency to have better control over your data and really make sure that like everyone's on the same page with you. Um, and then just a, another question to that, Erin, um, with all of that said, and like given the really great point that Cassie makes, um, is it possible, like, is this something where if you apply it to one agency admin or in one situation, it would have to be applied across the board? Or could the primary agency say, yes, I'm okay with this agency administrator from a different agency having the ability to delete um, certain things for my agency, like turning it on for specific agency admins for specific primary agencies, if that makes sense? Um, we can do that. So we could say like the default is agency administrators do not have access to, to delete data at other agencies, but the agency administrators at the primary agency can say, yes, this user should have access to delete. Um, we could do it that way. Um, and maybe when we, we could update our forms to our user request form to say like, sh should this agency administrator have access to delete these things, yes or no? Um, I, I like that idea because then it's still in the control of the primary agency to, um, to like make that call as to whether or not they're comfortable with it. Um, like, I think that that might be a, a good compromise or like a good way to balance everyone's like different thoughts since that's possible. Okay, the other thing just to maybe ease your mind a little bit is um, it is possible to, for deleted data to be undeleted, but that is only access that the system administrator, administrators have, so 211. Um, so the good news is if you know something was deleted by mistake, you can enter a ticket and we can undo it. The bad news is you would have to know that that was deleted incorrectly. So um, it might make you feel a little bit better, but not 100% better. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that that was um, a possible thing. So that is good to know. <laughs> That makes me feel better. Uh, yes. But at the same time, like I think too, even again, like specifically from that CES lens, there's so many agencies that have access to that project. 
that I do, I, I can foresee it happening where like, we would just have no idea. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'd be curious to know like what, um, every, like what everyone's thoughts would be too around like that workaround that you suggested Aaron on like being able to say whether or not you would like an agency administrator from, um, an additional agency to have the, that access, you know, and, and be able to request it that way. I think I kind of agree that is kind of like a happy medium, just so that way not all like agency administrators across the board. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I, I honestly like this is not affecting me and my role right now. <laughs> I'm just saying in my experience, like, you know, um, just kind of as an example, not to say that anything specific happened or that I can really give any specific examples, but like just, you know, in because there are folks that are, um, you know, in the system that are not the greatest at data entry. Um, you know, think about, you know, having to contact an agency who is very small or doesn't have the greatest um, communication and say they have entered, you know, a family as individuals or something like that. Like that's all things that, um, you know, we, those are the types of things that I'm thinking of. Um, but um, I'm just speaking from my past experience. And again, this is not gonna affect me at all. Um, maybe if you know JP was on this call, you would have a better, another opinion on it. Um, but um, because you know, I'm sure that that is still a thing, that there's still collaborative projects that Mercy Us is like <laughs> dealing with. Um, but, um, you know, it's been years now, so maybe people have their stuff together a little bit better now. But um, you know, it was it was just a little having all access to things like that was um, was nice to have if needed. But again, it's not doesn't affect me. So, and I agree, Catherine, that is kind of a little scary to have everybody's hands in coordinated entry. So. That's why, I don't know. Um, okay, and Amanda also put in the chat, she thinks just having just the primary agency with the ability to delete would make it more clean. So um, thanks, Amanda. Caitlin, did you wanna add anything or was your, your dog, did that say it all for you? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, no, I. I think that's it. Yeah, I just, I do kind of like the idea, like if this was to go forward, I kind of appreciate the concept of like, a, a, like us still having somewhat of a say as to who's going to have access of another agency, just because with so many hands in the pot, I would be worried about things possibly getting deleted. And, and like Catherine said, it would be impossible to know who did it or like, what client or if it was even deleted just because we have so many projects and so many enrollments and so many clients and stuff like that so um i would be like yeah i i guess that would be like a nice happy medium but to have all of them in there does make it a, a bit nerve-wracking so that's all <laughs> okay any other thoughts before we move forward. So it sounds like the group thinks the default should be no agency administrators should not have access to delete um, these four things. Um, and that the agency administrators at the primary agency can say for a specific user, yes, we want them to have access to delete. Uh, let's see, another question. If we do notice mistakes or duplicates, would we just contact you or would we have to try and find a way to contact the primary agency? Um, so it depends. If, if you are in a collaborative and you are 
So let's say agency A is the collaborative lead and they are the one that is housing the project. And then agency B is completing data entry into the project under agency A. Um, and a user at agency B thinks that there's an error with the data, like maybe something got deleted mistakenly or there's a duplicate. Um, agency B would probably want to work with agency A since agency A is the lead and they, they can review whatever the, the other agency thinks is incorrect and say, yes, that is wrong. Um, you know, we can fix it or we can enter a ticket with the help desk to fix it or no, that mistake, that's not a mistake. Um, and here's why. So yes, if you, Amanda, are the additional agency, I would say work directly with the primary agency first, and then um, we can, the, the help desk team can help out as needed. All right. Not seeing anything else in the chat or anybody unmuting. So I'm gonna move on to the coordinated entry question. So um, users with coordinated entry access um, have access to the referrals screen in HMIS. So I've listed here what that means. The, the user will be able to review clients on the community queue. Um, and then pretty much everything else on the referral screen is related to housing opportunities. So the user can add housing opportunities um, to be matched. They can review or deny matched housing opportunities. And they can also see any matches that were completed or denied. So the, my question is, should CES users with additional agency access have that function, functionality that I just mentioned that for agencies that are not their primary agency or the coordinated entry agencies? So should these users with additional agency access have the ability to edit housing opportunity data? for other agencies. Erin, I can very possibly be incorrect about this, but um, I thought that the referrals tab only shows if you're like an agency administrator um, for one of those agencies and not for like any CES user. Am I wrong though? Um, they do have access to the referrals tab because that's how they enter housing opportunities. Okay. Um, so any, any like user at an agency that can add housing opportunities has the referrals tab? Yes. Okay, um, and they would only be able to like deny uh, households that are matched to their agency, right? Not matched to any agency. They can only deny housing opportunities for the agencies that they have access to. So if they have access to three agencies and they have that referrals tab, they could potentially deny matches for any of those three agencies. Um, okay, thanks for clarifying that. <laughs> it didn't sound like you want them to have that access, Catherine. <laughs> well, it sounds like it sounds like they do already, right? Yes. Some do I mean I, ha I haven't heard that that's been an issue where like someone goes in and denies something that they shouldn't be doing. Um, but at the same time, like, is there a, is there a purpose as to why they have access to the referrals tab? So in the past, 
Um, so when you set up in a user account in Clarity, you have to say what access they have, whether it's agency access uh, or like staff access or coordinated entry access or agency administrator. And in the past, if you had agents, um, additional agency access, you had whatever that access role is for all agencies. But BitFocus recently added functionality where you can choose what the access role is for every agency a user has access to. So that's why um, it's possible to differentiate now. I mean, my initial thoughts are, I don't really think that someone would navigate to the referrals tab to like look for that information. I feel like if they were trying to find information about um, like clients who are on the queue or, or you know, wanting to review um, a specific client and whether or not like what their referral status is, I feel like they would just look up that client to see if they're on the queue or if they're um, still pending or pending in process under that that specific client's history. Um, and then aside from that, I mean, if they wanted to review clients on the queue or household or like households match to opportunities, they have access to run those reports under data analysis. So I don't, I just don't know that like their ability to view that information is, is how they, like they wouldn't get to this information through this route. Um, but at the same time, like it, it might be better to like err on the side of caution and just say, look, if you don't need this access, then there's no reason for you to have that access. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, that's kind of just where I'm left with is, I don't know that anyone would navigate to that section in order to really review that information. Does anybody know the situation where um, an, a user that is not a user at the primary agency, so they have additional agency access that they would need to enter housing opportunities um, for a project that's not under their primary agency? I mean, we have that at FSC um, where like we have contracts where um, other housing housing providers can, you know, are, are working on those, those grants. Um, but the way we handle that is we just post the opportunities ourselves or I think, I'm not sure actually, um, I would have to ask like Josie on our team if if those housing providers are going in under there and, and creating that, or if we are for them. But if they are, then yeah, that is a reason why they would need the access um, in, in there. So let me, let me ask her, Erin, and I'll let you know. Okay. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this one? All right. Um, so Catherine, I'll wait to hear back from you on that, but I'll launch this poll in case anybody else has any thoughts on this? So should CES users with additional agency access be able to add, edit, modify, housing opportunity data at other agencies. I'll give it a few more seconds. All right, I'm gonna end the poll. 
Um, all right, so most of you said no, they should not have access. Um, so we can take that into account. And then um, Catherine, we can also talk separately um, when you talk with Josie and see what the best solution for that is. Okay, that sounds good. And I got a note. So we, and we could, I think, also do something similar with what we were talking about with agency administrators, where the default is no, they don't have access. Um, but we could give certain users access if there is a need. So that's an option also. Yeah, and I just uh, got confirmation from Josie that um, that in that sort in like that situation that I just said to you that those other providers are the ones posting it under our agency. So um, I know that we can connect more offline, or you could always do the the additional access request type thing that you just mentioned. But um, but but there's your situation of when it happens. Okay. All right. All right, thanks again, everybody, for your feedback on the poll. So let me go to the next item. HMIS monthly webinars. So um, what is going on? We, I have listed here the four webinars that we are currently hosting on a monthly basis. So each webinar happens um, three times a year. And we wanted to have the webinars live um, to give the opportunity for users to ask questions and um, you know they could follow along if they'd like and to just provide a little more support for the agencies. Um, the flip side of that obviously is that it is, you know, takes up time every month for us to prep and host that. And the last few months, um, we've had maybe 10 to 20 users attend the training, maybe less, um, but there's been like no questions during the webinar. So it, it makes me question whether or not it needs to continue to happen live or if it's something that we can publish the recording of those webinars and um, make them available to users that way so that they can ask questions. So I wanted to get feedback from the group on that. Um, you know, first, if um, which of the webinars are useful um, and if pre-recorded webinars would be a sufficient replacement instead of doing them live. I think the HMIS part two training and the coordinated entry training could be a recording. Um, I think that would actually be better. Um, so we could, you know, as people come on board or people ask questions, we can link them to it. Um, the looker training and is, um, I, I don't know that that needs to happen so often, um, but I think for that, I think that there's probably maybe more questions that would be asked. Um, also less people, you know, would attend, like if you did it less often, I think more people would attend. Um, maybe, um, so I don't know that that many people actually use Looker aside from like, data staff like our normal you know hmis users are not going into looker um and the agency administrator training obviously that's that is also not a very frequent um you know how often are agencies turning over their agency administrators um i don't know honestly they could probably all be recorded um but maybe just not as often, you know, maybe not every month. <laughs> um, if, 
you know, I, I, I do, I am concerned about the, the questions part, but if you're not getting any questions right now, then yeah. um, um, that's always something that, you know, people can ask each other too. And if not, then there's, they can open a ticket if there's questions, but that's my, I think it would be helpful to have, have them all recorded, but, you know, so that you guys don't have to do them as often. Um, but if you wanted to do live training to take questions, then that's something on you. That's up to you. Okay. Um, other thoughts from the group? Um, is it helpful having the webinars every month would less frequently work or would recorded webinars be as helpful as live webinars? To piggyback off of what Cassie was saying, I kind of agree. I feel like once people have taken the HMIS part two and the coordinated entry training, or even just going through like um, knowledge-based articles and stuff, you don't, once you've done it once, you don't necessarily have to do it again. And it would be really nice to have that link so we can send it to new staff or anyone that might have questions. It might be more convenient that way because I have sent out like emails to staff in the past telling them like there's webinars and they can attend if they want to, to gain more knowledge on like coordinated entry and stuff. But I, I don't think that there is a huge turnout of people that are um, actually attending and asking questions and stuff. And um, the, like Cassie said, I feel like the only one that would really have a lot of questions is the looker training. I think that would be the one that's most beneficial live. But if it makes it easier on you guys, <laughs> then I would vote for less often as well. And maybe some of them, um, like the two our recordings, the coordinated entry and HMIS part two. Yeah, and that's exactly what I was, I, I left out was that, you know, I know that our staff, we have, you know, they have very, very busy schedules where they're like out in the field all day long. Um, so it's not always convenient for them to stop what they're doing on their schedule and like sit down for an hour and watch like, you know, the ins and outs of coordinated entry, but I know that I've had staff ask questions about coordinated entry. So I think if they could do something like a training like this on their own time um, to learn more, they might visit the link more often than they would have, you know, they would, they would be able to do that more easily than to schedule a meeting and sit down and do a training. Okay. Anyone else have thoughts? I think it would be good to have recordings of those um, because then, yeah, as, as people need it, it's available. Um, and if it's the same four that are going, you know, like rotating throughout the year, um, then you're saving yourself you know, like your team some time. Um, and, and hopefully people would know that they could always like submit a ticket um, and reach out to you guys if they have any specific questions about that training or, you know, reach out to their agency administrator, um, especially if you're not getting a lot of, you know, feedback or live questions when you're hosting them now. And the knowledge-based articles are so helpful. Like, I feel like a lot of, if there were any questions specifically about some of these topics, then we would also be able to refer to like knowledge-based articles and the recordings and stuff like that to get the instruction. I'm so glad you like them, Caitlin. <laughs> I really do. I love referring to them and I think that they're super convenient and I appreciate them a lot. <laughs> I appreciate you for appreciating them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, let me do just some, one quick poll on this one, just to give everyone an opportunity to weigh in. The first 
question is asking which of the following webinars are useful for your agency's users. Um, this just kind of helps us understand what we should focus on um, and or not focus on. And the second is, would pre-recorded webinars be a sufficient replacement for your users? Yes or no? I have to jump off and um, go to another meeting in a few minutes. So um, thank you. And Caitlin and Abel are gonna stay on and take notes for me if there's anything <laughs> that I need to be aware of, but thanks guys. Okay, Bye. thanks for participating, Cassie. All right, bye. All right, I'm just giving it a couple seconds and then I'm gonna close this one out. All right, so looking at the results, um, thank you guys all for participating again. Um, it looks like almost everyone finds the HMIS part two useful as well as the coordinated entry. Um, Actually, the agency administrator data quality was a 10 out of 11. So that was that's pretty exciting. Um, and then Looker was a little bit less, um, which makes sense because only certain users are focusing on the data. So that um, is unsurprising. And then most said that pre-recorded webinars would be a good replacement. Um, there was only uh, one or two of you that said, no, that would not be a good replacement. So. Thank you so much. We'll take your feedback into consideration as um, as we plan for these moving forward. Um, but your your feedback is very helpful. So I'm going to move on to our last item, which is the permanent supportive housing and other permanent housing project performance reports. All right. So project performance reports. These reports were from August 1st, 2020 through uh, July 31st, 2021. Um, thank you so much for the agencies that were able to make revisions to their data prior to publishing. Um, for those of you that are COC funded permanent supportive housing projects, the this report that we just published um, will not be used towards your NOFA ranking for um, this next year, but now is a great time for you to review your data closely and make sure it makes sense. Make sure you understand why you got the score you got. Um, if you don't know why, come talk to us, um, ask us questions, because when we do this report again, in February or March, whatever it is, that report is going to count on your NOFA next year. And you don't wanna be asking these questions then. You wanna ask them now so that next time you're getting full points on your NOFA score. So keep that in mind um, as you review your data. As always, we have the project scores for all of the permanent supportive housing and other permanent housing projects. So you can see how you're doing on all your measures, um, as well as what percentage of the measures that project met. Um, and then I wanna focus a little more time on the goals and outcomes report for the whole project type. So you can see for each of the measures, um, we added some more data so that you can see more of the history of how the project is performing, the project type is performing over time. Um, and overall, uh, the project type is staying consistent, which is not a bad thing. Um, it just um, kind of is what it is sometimes with some of these measures. So the first one is looking at um, clients entering from literal homeless situations. Um, across the four reporting periods, we're staying very consistent. Um, and we're just under our threshold of 100%. Um, 
And this is frequently due to, um, well, I'll, go, I'll get into the details when we get to measure one, but you can see we're fairly consistent over the past four years. Um, just to note, there is a little bit of a, a break in the reports. And if you remember, this is because um, of COVID, we stopped doing project performance reports for six or eight months, something like that. So that's why there's this gap, but um, we are back on our normal schedule. So moving forward, you'll be getting these reports every six months. Um, goal four is looking at how many days it's taking to place a household in a unit um, once they've been enrolled in the project. So there's been a little bit more fluctuation in this measure, but our most recent score is um, within 21 days, which is meeting our 30-day threshold. Goal five is looking at unit utilization for projects. And um, we have consistently met this threshold for the past um, four reports, which is great. Um, this means that the, the units in the projects are being filled and are not remaining empty long-term. Goal six is looking at adults that increase their income while they remained in your project. Um, and again, we are staying consistent over the four reporting periods. And we are, we've been just under our threshold, um, but we're very close. And um, one, one response we hear from agencies in regards to this measure is a lot of times clients in permanent supportive housing do not have changes in income um, because they are frequently disabled. But um, we do want to just make sure that you are entering cost of living increases um, that some clients are receiving from their disability benefits uh, because that, that does count as an increase in income. So please make sure you are entering those updates on an annual basis for your clients. Goal seven is looking at clients that increase their income as a project exit. Um, we've had a little bit of a dip since the last time we ran these reports, but we're still um, fairly consistent. Um, and again, make sure you are entering those cost of living increases at exit also, because those um, do count as a positive result. Rule nine is looking at the percentage of clients that were stabilized in permanent housing. So this means they either were placed in a housing unit and active in, in the project at the end of the reporting period, or they exited to a permanent housing destination. Um, and you can see this is a very strong measure for the project type because the, the purpose of permanent supportive housing is to put clients in units and keep them there with um, supportive services and other, and other means. So this is usually um, an easy measure for our COC, but um, it's great. So the last measure is looking at clients that exited to permanent housing and then later return to the homeless system. This is another measure that we usually are um, really strong at also. And so you can see um, our threshold is 7%. We have consistently met that threshold over the past four reporting periods. So um, in October, 6% of clients that exited to permanent housing from um, a PSH project later returned to the homeless system, which is um, very low. So that's great. Okay, so going into the details of goal one. So you can, so again, this is clients entering from homeless situations. You can see the percentage for the project type as well as different subpopulations. Um, the, Lowest percent of entries from homelessness is veterans at 79%. Um, and then you can see in our little donut here, those clients that are not entering from homeless situations, this is telling you where they are entering from. So 36% that information was missing, um, followed by 
permanent housing situations, family and friends, and temporary situations. So again, if you're a permanent supportive housing provider, um, you should be following up with these clients where the information at entry was missing, um, because that is likely um, homeless situations that you're not capturing. So um, as much as you can try to limit those missing responses, if you can follow up with clients and ask them, maybe when you developed a little bit more of a relationship, uh, you can say, hey, where were you staying you know, before you came to see us um, and try and capture that information. Uh, goal four, placing households and units um, as soon as possible. So again, this is the number of days between their enrollment date and the date they're placed in a housing unit. Um, and it's pretty consistent across all of the subpopulations, except for veterans, which is very low, which is kind of surprising. Um, it could be due to um, additional housing opportunities being made available for veterans. Um, I don't know if anyone on the call has any thoughts or anecdotes about working with veterans about why they would be placed in a unit so much more quickly, or if it's just kind of a anomaly with this data. I'm looking to see if there's any permit housing providers on the call. I know Gary, but I don't think you're serving any veterans. Are you Gary? Uh, let's see. Gary says no veterans. Um, what about, oh, Manny left. Um, Amanda, are, do you have any experience with veterans at your agency? Or are you mostly not serving veterans? She also said no. Sad. OK, well, this is just going to be a mystery for another day. But um, we also have here in our little bar chart the length of days to permanent housing placements. Um, and the threshold for this measure is within 30 days. Um, so you can see the vast majority of enrollments are falling within that threshold, which is great. Um, and then there are a few that are taking between a month and two months, and then 45 that are over two months to place in permanent housing units. So um, the good news is, most clients are being placed in permanent housing very quickly. All right, goal five, ensuring projects are being fully utilized. So this is making sure that the units in your project are filled um, with clients and not remaining empty. So there is some variation um, between households with children and households without children, but um, Looking at the, the PSH data and what, and what I know about some of the PSH pro projects, I, um, it looks like the reason that household with children is a lot lower is because um, a lot of projects can serve either households with children or households without children. And um, at the time when we pull this report, um, we are, we are basing the inventory on what is collected in the HIC. So um, if on the HIC, a household said that they had a unit for households with children, but since then they have filled that unit for um, a, house, a household that doesn't have children, uh, that could, that's why this is a little off balanced here. It doesn't impact your project score at all, it doesn't matter if it's who it's filled by, but just looking at our data as a project type, that is why households with children is more and households without children is, or sorry, households without children has a higher utilization and households with children has a lower utilization is because of that fluctuation with how um, vouchers can be utilized. 
Um, and so, and you can see here, this is a breakdown of how the project scored. Um, most of the, or about half of the projects fell within normal range for utilization um, by HUD standards, which is 65% to 105%. Seven projects were under that minimum utilization and 12 were over. And, and again, the, those that were over the utilization, um, that is frequently due to the nature of voucher projects as well. Um, they, many projects, um, they say we have vouchers for 40 households, but if um, it's less expensive to serve a household than the agency thought, they may be able to serve an additional household, which would bring their utilization over that 100% capacity for per support of housing. So that's what's going on there. Goal six is adults who increase their income while remaining in the project. Um, very consistent across all the subpopulations, which is great. And then in our donut, you can see the breakdown um, for the different clients included in the measure. So 59% increased their income, 19% decreased, 13% um, maintained, and 9% had no income. So for this measure, um, the potential for additional positive outcomes is is in the would probably be in the maintained income category um, because if you entered a client's income at entry and then you exited them or did an annual assessment or whatever the case may be the the assessment will pull over the last income that you entered so there if you don't review that or update that, then it could show up as maintained income for the client. So again, make sure when you're completing those annual assessments or exits, make sure you're looking at that income, even if it was, uh, even if it's not blank, make sure you're reviewing it and make sure in particular, you're looking at those dollar amounts and that they are correct so that you're getting those positive outcomes as much as possible. All right, looking at the exits and adults that increase their income. Um, fairly standard, again, except for veterans are lower than the other subpopulations, but there's also just a few veterans that are included in the measure. So um, it, that could be the cause for the lower performance. And um, again, about 50% of of clients that exited had increased income, 24% maintained, and then 14% had no income and 12% decreased. So um, we're doing fairly well as a project type. We are meeting the threshold, which is 45%. So that's great for this measure. Um, stabilizing clients in permanent housing. Like I mentioned before, this is a, usually a very easy measure for the project type to meet, as you can see um, here. Uh, and we included a bar chart. So uh, for those that are not stabilizing, what's happening with them? And most of them are exiting to homeless situations, followed by clients that are exiting with um, missing destination information, and then temporary and institutional settings. All right. And then our last measure is looking at clients that exited to permanent housing and later returned to homelessness. So um, you can see again that consistency across the different populations, except for veterans, which are doing inexplicably better. <laughs> Although they're, they had a much smaller population, so that could be the reason also. Um, but in our donut, you can see 
the project types that the clients are returning to after they exit permanent housing. So um, there's almost an even split between clients returning to emergency shelter and permanent supportive housing or other permanent housing, followed by street outreach projects. And I'm looking at the, the permanent supportive housing returns and I'm wondering if maybe it's a data quality issue. So um, when you get your corrections from us regarding returns to homelessness, make sure you look at that list um, because, so there's a column on there that says, is it a return to homelessness, yes or no? So you'll wanna look at those that said yes and look at the exit date from your project and the entry date into the following project because um, if it, there's some cases when a client needs to exit your permanent supportive housing project and they're getting moved to another, another permanent supportive housing project, that's fine and that's allowable. Um, but if they are being moved, their exit date from your project and the entry date in the next project should be the same day um, because they're transitioning projects. If it's longer than that, um, that can potentially count as a return against you. So that's why I'm saying you wanna check those dates and make sure they're accurate. Um, and the reason I'm suspicious about this, this little blue section is because most permanent supportive housing or other permanent housing projects are not taking clients directly from the street into their project. Um, so, which leads me to, lead, to believe these may be transfers. So, so look at those dates when we send you your corrections. And then our last little bar chart here is looking at how long it's taking clients to return to the homeless system after they exit from a permanent supportive housing project to permanent housing. Um, you can see half of the clients are returning to homelessness within six months of their permanent housing exit. Um, and then there's another 10 that are exiting between six months and a year. And then a few more that are exiting one to two years after their permanent housing exit. So um, this could be a case for maybe um, additional providing additional support at the time of exit or um, you know, making sure they have resources that they can contact in case of things not working out um, since they're, they're coming back so soon from their permanent housing exit, that could be something to consider um, for, for these clients. Um, but that is the entire Permanent supportive housing and other permanent housing report. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments about the report? Um, if not, then that is everything I have to share today. Um, as usual, we will send out a wrap up email with the recording of this meeting, as well as the slides and minutes. Um, and the next meeting will be scheduled for November 11th. Oh, that's Veterans Day for some people. We'll have to figure that out. <laughs> um, so we'll, when we send out the wrap up email about this meeting, we will, um, also let you know when the next meeting will be and um, or if, if it's canceled potentially we'll, we'll let you know that also but um, we'll send out the meeting minutes and I will hang out for a minute in case anybody has any questions other than that have a great day everybody thanks Erin thank you thanks everybody
All right. Uh, looks like everybody's jumping off. So I'm going to wrap up the meeting. Thanks, everyone.